Hello, Simon Boswell. You've scored many interesting films over your career, but my favorite has to be Santa Sangra. And I was wondering if you can uh, tell me a little bit about Alejandro Jodorowsky and what, what he's like as a guy. Well, uh, Alejandro is possibly the most interesting, uh, strange personality <laughs> I've ever met in my life. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'd actually seen one of his movies, you know, quite a few years before I worked with him. I worked I'd seen El Topo, um, the film, and it always, you know, it, it kind of blew my mind at the time. So I, when I when I was called by um, my kind of contacts in in Rome, in Italy, and you have to understand this came about because of Dario Argento, with whom I had started working in the mid '80s in Rome, scoring Phenomena with a band called Goblin. That's that's how I started. Um, Santa Sangre, the film, is was produced by Dario's brother. Claudio Argento so he came about through that connection and and um well Claudio ran me up and said was I interested in working with Jodorowsky and I said yes I am mm -hmm. straight away flew out to Rome met him in the cutting rooms at Cinecita in, in Rome and uh, we seemed to just really get along you know he was a, he's a very trusting person interesting Trusting person. So, uh, how did you how did you originally hook up with Dario Argento? You you mentioned that you uh, had jid with Goblin on Phenomena, but you, didn't you also did projects that uh, Dario produced, like the, the Church or Demons Two? How how did you, yeah. was it through Claudio that you connected with Dario? No, no, it wasn't at all. It was actually kind of quite a random connection. I mean, at the time, I was not intending to be a film composer. I mean, I'd been in various bands. I've always been a musician, but um, at the time I was producing Italian pop stars and Italian singer songwriters in Rome. Um, I'm doing, doing really well at it actually, um, selling lots of albums and stuff. So I, I simply was introduced to Dario at a party and I had no idea who he was or what he'd done. And, um, he was talking to me. We were just sat there drinking a glass of wine. <laughs> he was saying he had this film and his usual guys called Goblin were, you know, finding it difficult to maybe cover the whole movie. So would I work with them? So I said, yeah, sure. You know, I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> Well, well, what is what a fantastic music though? Claudio Simonetti is. Uh, I, I actually got to sit down with him uh, when he came to Ottawa back in uh, November, I think it was. Yeah. And he, oh my God, that guy has great stories. Um, so you did Demons Two, like we said, and Claudio had done Demons One, and what a score that was. Did you feel any pressure to to equal or match him at all for for uh, no. Demons Two? I never listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's easy then. Okay. <clears throat> I, 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 you know, uh, people that know me will confirm this. You know, I'm, I, I, it's perhaps a bad trait of my personality, but I don't listen to very much music at all. I mean, I, oh. there's a part of me doesn't want to hear other people's things either because they'll be so good. I'll get all bitter and twisted mm -hmm. or because it's so bad. I don't want to listen to it. <laughs> so I honestly, I have avoided listening to almost everything. I can safely say there's probably only two or three goblin tracks I've listened to in my life. Oh my God. That's hilarious. That's so interesting to hear. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Jeez. And did you like those tracks that you heard? Well, the thing is, the thing is this, I, I, I like them more now yeah. um, than I did then. You have to understand the kind of history, history here which is that we i'm coming out of a punk rock revolution essentially in the uk um and sort of existing in this sort of post-punk world i get to rome and listening to simonetti stuff i feel like i'm in the mid 1970s and a kind of prog rock band yeah okay? so i i never liked prog rock i like it a lot more nowadays than i did then then it seemed like everything that sort of punk hated, mm. you know, too many notes, stupid, you know, um, costumes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> self-indulgence. Um, so the the time at which I worked with them, you know, I was kind of like, you know, sitting in the corner really watching them do their, their thing and Claudio's thing, which he does very, very well. I'm, I, I'm not knocking it. But my agenda was to try and move Argento to a more gothic uh post-punk uh, influence, if you like, okay. away from prog rock and for heavy metal. Interesting. Huh. 
I didn't know any of this. So, um, is it true that you were approached to score from Dust Till Dawn? I was certainly. I had a call from from Tarantino's office, oh. inquiring of my availability on that. And what what um, happened there? What what happened is that they they had assumed that I was living in Los Angeles and was oh. sort of available to immediately come and have a meeting with them. And I wasn't. I was in London at that point in time. So. Um, it kind of the whole thing fell apart because of they deemed that to me for me being unavailable. You know. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Would you have done it? Do you like Tarantino? I think I would definitely have definitely done that. Yeah, I would have done that. Um, yes, I would. I mean, mainly because of Robert Rodriguez <laughs> directing it. Oh. Um, Tarantino doesn't take to composers very well. I don't think. True, true. Unless you're Ennio Morricone, and you know. Unless you're only more and I think that ended in tears to be to an extent. I don't think it was a happy experience, certainly from from Morricone. Oh, I I heard that 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 interview that you, I think you're referring to was debunked by Morricone. But who knows? Maybe maybe Ennio who does knows? think he is a louse and all these things that he said. Yeah, I mean that, <laughs> that's something that I disapprove greatly of. Even though I think Tarantino's use of music is is good, and mm-hmm. especially of more obscure things, but I think he's sort of terrified of trusting somebody else to come and ruin his film, you know, <laughs> a <laughs> composer. And that's where he's coming from with it. And I, I know this very well, having done so many movies, the, the point at which composers get hired is the point of maximum paranoia <laughs> in a film making because directors and producers simply do not know if their film is any good. And the idea of you handing this over to somebody else at that stage can be very sensitive. So I understand it. But I still think he's he needs to trust in people. <laughs> I think Tarantino needs a, a decent editor too. Okay, yeah, he said uh, once uh, if it doesn't come from him, it's unsatisfactory by its very nature, which is a, a pretty intense thing to say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> do you do you watch your movies once you've scored them? Um, yeah. So you know, if sometimes if there's like a screening of the finished thing, I will go. I'll go and see that. Yeah, but quite often not. Did you did you see the screening of uh, Santa Sangra when it came out? Oh, I did. Yeah, absolutely, I did. And and I went to Cannes, oh. um, the film festival, with Jodorowsky. Oh my god! Uh, and went there. And I actually I, I did a press conference with him after the screening of oh. Santa Sangra. Um, though nobody asked me one single question, understandably, because <laughs> he's a very yeah. he's a very charismatic and interesting character. Um, I think. Um, the uh, the lowly musician was uh, in, it was kind of a dispensable did, phenomenon. <laughs> uh, did you hear about the story where uh, Kanye West uh, wanted met Jodorowsky and Jodorowsky sold him three ideas? No, I haven't heard this. No. Yeah, Kanye West is apparently a big Jodorowsky fan, but it, uh, from the from Jodorowsky's perspective, it, it sounded uh, incredibly surreal. From it, it, that's saying a lot. If Kanye West was kind of cr- Maybe creeping him out for Jodorowsky. That's that's big. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyways, uh, who who are who were some of your favorite composers? You said you didn't listen to very many, but uh, who were some of the before you got in the game, and who are some that you admire who are currently working? Well, okay. The first time I really noticed film music, I was probably about six or seven years old or something. And my mum, I remember me and my brother, we both had uh, chicken pox and we're off school. And she thought, well, you know, I might as well take him to the cinema. And Lawrence of Arabia had just Ooh. come out. So I was thinking to see that. And that's the first time I really noticed the music having this big effect on me. And obviously, that's Maurice, Maurice Jarre. Um, I don't have any particular other connections to having listened to Maurice Jarre, but that was the first time I noticed music in in film per se and subsequent to that would have been when I got a bit older and was watching films I wasn't supposed to watch you know like Psycho and things that were going to give me bad dreams and stuff mm. and the clearly Bernard Herrmann at work was the master for me certainly in terms of orchestral music beyond that Morricone himself you know cut really to spaghetti westerns and that's the next time it made a big impression upon me are there any uh, contemporary ones that, that you're hip to or that you like? I, 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 I'm always very um, 
keen to to listen to hear Thomas Newman's scores because I think he's very fresh. Mm. I don't find most other film composers to be particularly fresh. Obviously, mm. I, I, you know, I'm impressed by the Jerry Goldsmiths and John Williamses of this world. Um, but you know, I, let me say, okay, there's another composer who definitely impressed me just from watching the film is John Carigliano. Um, from Altered States, you know, seeing his score for hearing oh. his score for Altered States, uh, that that was something that really made me want to do very experimental and atonal music. All right, I talked to a composer back in uh, September named Federico Justin, and he's worked on many interesting new films. Uh, and he told mm-hmm. me he watches the movie six to nine times before he writes a note of music. So, right. how many times do you watch a movie before you start writing to it? I'm really impatient. I will force myself to watch it once, but then I just really want to get on with it. I think I think it's a smart move to watch it a few times, I, because I, I also have said to many people um, before that I studied English literature at college, not music, mm. and I think that that's a, as it turns out, that was a more useful discipline for being a film composer and. Being you know studying music in depth, simply because you have to understand what something is about. It's a, it's a bit it's like reading a novel, mm. uh, watching a film. So you have to really understand where you fit into the great arc of what this is about, and in discussion with the director, you know what you want music to do at any given time is is hu- is a hugely ambiguous question. So um, I and I, I find up that having studied. Sh- Shakespeare and things like that a lot. Um, the, the 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 kind of text that's not written, you know, the 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 imagery, the kind of themes that bubble in and out, they're very important to me in a film. So um, I, I I but I discover them as I'm going along. You know, I, I will watch it once and try and get a, an overall sweep of what the thing is is about, and then discuss it with the director really because it's important. I think. It's it's not your film. I mean, the composers will know this, <laughs> mm-hmm. complain about it a lot. But you know, I I'm doing a, doing a job for somebody else's creative endeavor, really, and trying to make the most of it. Uh, so I love the score to Stage Fright, uh, particularly the opening titles track. How would you describe yeah. the style of that music? <laughs> okay, um, I suppose it's as if oh gosh. Now I'm going to go blank with the kind of influences on this. Uh, to me, it was kind of like um, freeform jazz and breakbeat, kind of like early hip hop. It was, it's yeah, really cool stuff. Yeah, early hip hop bits, but yeah. so it definitely was. And there was an element of me really listening to Jaco Pastorius, the bass player oh. from Westport, you know, who played fretless bass. And I thought, I, I'm going to do that, but on a synth. Oh, but try and get the sort of freedom that he has in it. I'm not a jazzer by any means, um, but there are certain things which I've heard over the years, you know, which has stuck with me and which I thought, you know, it, it has a kind of particular um, lonely resonance to it. Mm. That, that What I was trying to do with that score. Well, it's really fantastic. I think people should listen to it a lot. Uh, I know I have lately. Uh, what is essential to you for a good score? If you were going to boil it down elementally, well, okay. Um, I, I, I was taught very early on by both Dario Argento and by John mm. to to be careful not to give people the same information twice. That's interesting, especially if you're doing a kind of art house movie or something that you know where you're asking the audience to be a little more intelligent about watching the film. There's a tendency in Hollywood, you know, to underline everything. In other words, give, uh-huh. definitely give them the same information twice. If it's a car chase, have car chasing music, you know. Have everything very on the nose uh, in case people, you know, stop eating their popcorn and walk out or flip channel or whatever they do. But um, Jodorowsky taught me in particular to, to write themes which are very contrary to what you're watching because it makes the audience more interested it makes them question what it is and it creates this kind of resonance between your eyes and your ears which i think can give a film intellectual depth if you like and emotional depth so for me immediately i i want to take a perspective on the scene uh, in discussion with the director of course you know as to how to make this more interesting for people 
Wow, this has been a very interesting interview, and I really appreciate your time, Simon Boswell. Maybe, uh, before I let you go, can you uh, maybe please tell me what you've got coming out in the future? Um, I have in the future. I've, I've just signed a deal to do five Mexican horror films. What? <laughs> with, uh, with five different directors. Um, the first one being with someone who I know and I've, I've been trying to work with. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the two is called Adrian Garcia Bogliano. He's uh, originally Spanish, I think, or maybe Argentinian, but lives in Mexico. Uh, that's the first film that I'm going to do. So there's a whole series of those coming. And Mexico, as we know from the Oscars, is the new hot place. You know, it's uh, there's a lot, lot of good filmmakers coming out of there. It's crazy how how many uh, times this past decade the best director award has gone to a Mexican. It's unbelievable. Yes, absolutely true. And I will mention now, just because I've gone public with this um, via a Twitter, that, a tweet that I answered just yesterday. Um, I've worked a lot with Richard Stanley over the years. In fact, scored almost everything he's ever done. And circumstances have conspired that he, his latest film, the, the Color Out of Space, I will not be scoring. Ah. Um, not because I don't want to, and not because Richard doesn't want me to, but because the producers of the film have deemed me and everyone else Richard's ever worked with completely irrelevant. Aww. So I, I'm a bit pissed off about it. You should and be. prepared to do interviews about it, uh, because I think I feel like people, producers, of course, have their every right to hire who they want, but in this circumstance, I think the, the director, Richard, has, has been denied a lot of his creative freedoms, which made him good in the first place. Uh, and I would consider making an issue of this especially you know with hollywood who seem to ride roughshod over people's creative work yep okay thank you so much for your time simon simon boswell okay